In today's Old Testament reading from the prophet Isaiah, God says, thus says the Lord, right? Keep justice and do righteousness. For soon my salvation will come and my righteousness will be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Keeping justice and keeping the Sabbath. Not really a, a connection that we might immediately jump to, right? Yet, yet here it is in a prophetic passage of scripture speaking not just to Israelites returning to the promised land from exile, but also to us that have been transferred from the kingdoms of darkness and of this world into the kingdom of God. See, even though this is an Old Testament passage, Sabbath can't just be dismissed as we often um, uh, tend to do as kind of just this day off or uh, thought of as a time uh, even worse than a day off as something where we can't do what we'd really like to do. We see in this passage that, that Sabbath is a fundamental aspect of what it means to be part of the people of God, to listen to the word of God. Thus saith the Lord here, right? Um, okay, so what does that mean for us, though, today as New Testament Christians? We're going to get to that. First, I want, I want to help you understand what it meant, what Sabbath meant for the Old Testament people of God and how that relates to Keeping justice. Again, what an interesting connection. First, Sabbath was and is a way to put trust in God into practice. Sabbath was and is still today a way to put trust in God into practice. Because to cease from kind of producing, even for a day, is an act of faith for human beings. And this was maybe especially so for an ancient people that was wandering in the desert where resources were really scarce. There was a lot of work to do every day just to survive. Yet God instituted the Sabbath in the midst of that situation, right? While they're in the desert, he instituted the Sabbath and connected to that, he provided food for them on that day in a supernatural way. If you want to read more about that story, really cool story, Exodus 16, read that. But he did that as a sign that they could trust him for their provision, their daily bread, their salvation in that situation. Now, look, everybody's called to work as an expression of our care to others and our creativity as, as we're able and gifted and all that. But it's always God that ultimately provides for our needs. That's what that institution of the Sabbath was about. Um, and it's crucial, too, to how the people of God approach justice, and this is why. Because our basic posture of trust in God for all of our provision, every part of our life, not just our food on Sundays, but every part of our Saturdays, depending on when you're observing the Sabbath, uh, we, our, our trust in Him for our whole provision and our protection allows us to pursue God's vision of justice, which is always restorative and redemptive, and that's always a risk to us, instead of punitive and retaliatory. So when we trust God, we can pursue a risky kind of justice that results in restoration, redemption, all that stuff. Instead of just trying to punish people, instead of just trying to retaliate, instead of just trying to get revenge. Okay, second, Sabbath was and is today a reminder that constant work is in fact oppression and slavery, whether that is other people imposing that on you or whether you're imposing it on yourself. Constant work is oppression and slavery and God's people are not destined for that. They're destined for freedom. That's part of what the Sabbath is about. When God formally institutes the Sabbath, 
as a law for his people. And it existed prior to that. Remember, in creation, God creates and rests. So, I mean, there's, there's always been a Sabbath. Um, but, but he formally kind of puts it into law in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And listen to what he says. Listen to what God says. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. You see how Sabbath is connected to their release from bondage in in Egypt. As slaves, they had no concept of taking a day of rest. They were worked all day, every day. But God wants his people to know, I've delivered you, and now you are free. You're not a slave anymore. So back in Genesis, God creates and he takes this time after he creates the universe. He takes this time to kind of rest from that, which means to stop. I mean, God doesn't need to like, uh, you know, physically relax. Um, but but, but he, took, he took a moment to stop and say, this is good. This is good. I'm enjoying this thing that I've made, these people that I have made. It's good. So this is part of God's character. It's not just an arbitrary rule. This is a reflection of who God is, what he's like. And so slavery or even self-imposed constant work in any form is inherently sinful. Yeah, I'm going to go there. Absolutely. Workaholism is a problem. Um, It's inherently sinful and it's opposed to to justice. It's opposed to the justice that flows from who God is, what he's like. Finally, Sabbath was a way to ensure that that everyone had a chance to provide for themselves and for their family. How is that possible? Okay, listen up. Sabbath wasn't just about one day a week. In the Old Testament, Sabbath was, was expanded. If we read in Leviticus chapter 25, we read about how the land was given a Sabbath. Like every seven years, every six years, there was a seventh year to kind of let the land rest so that it could, it could continue to produce well. Um, there was a special Sabbath year every 50th year. It was called the year of Jubilee. Now, in the Jubilee year, this is going to fly in the face of, of, of every political uh, affiliation and economic theory that you are loyal to, okay? Um, what would happen is in the 50th year, all land sales would go back to the original owners. And remember, when when the people of God went into the promised land, God gave land to each and every family. And so all those land sales would go back to the very first owners. Every family had land and indentured servants who were often in that situation where they kind of, they were kind of in this contractual perpetual service to somebody else they were usually in that situation because of some kind of debt that they could, they could not pay. Um, they were completely freed in that year as well. And they were given a chance to start over. So it's kind of this once in a generation, if you think about it for 50 years, every once in a generation, there was this economic reset to keep the systems fair and to keep the poverty in check and to make sure everybody was cared for and provided for kind of regardless of how dumb they had been or their family had been or whatever. Now, the main reason for that is because in the Bible, the idea is that everything ultimately belongs to God. And this comes through in this passage in Leviticus 25. God says, hey, uh, I know you're not going to like this, but just so you know, everything belongs to me anyways. And so this is how we're going to do it. And and, and the idea is that his people don't need, because God is so good and so gracious and, and, and wants to take care of us, that, that we don't need to accumulate wealth over generations. We just don't have to do that. God's going to take care of us. So you see again that God's justice has to do with this deep trust in him as our provider for good future, not just today, not just in a week or in a year, but, but generations from now for our children. It's a lot of trust that God's asking us to put in him. But you know what? He always, he always proves that he's trustworthy. 
We're going to get to that in a minute. See, look, you might think the Sabbath is this Old Testament concept. Okay, okay, Nathan. Um, But it's no longer applicable to those of us that are under the new covenant, right? Like, you're in this old law stuff, Nathan. What's going on, man? But every part of the Old Testament is applicable to New Testament Christians. And this is why. Because every part is fulfilled in Christ. So I want to just walk through some of the ways that this, we could think about this being fulfilled in Christ. Well, first of all, Jesus said, Matthew 12, 18, Jesus said he's Lord of the Sabbath. So is, is Jesus Lord of something that no longer applies to us? That's, that's what I want to know. Like, I don't think so. You know what I mean? Like, see, Jesus says he's Lord of the Sabbath. So Sabbath, we, we, it's got to have something to do with us today. Well, what about the idea of trusting in God? That Sabbath was given to us to give us a way to trust in God. Well, Jesus himself gives us the ultimate reason to trust in God because he is God. Come to us in the flesh and he gave his own life as an act of selfless and and, and loving uh, 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 sacrifice to defeat death. Even our own selfishness. He did that for us on our behalf. And and despite what we deserve, God accomplishes justice in that moment with Christ on the cross. He accomplishes the weight of the sin of the world, not by punishing people. I mean, he condemned sin in the flesh in Jesus, but he doesn't punish people. He's forgiving and providing for people in that moment, even all the way to death. So you see both how, how this, this, this brings us to a point of trust in the Lord because of what he's done for us and also how it shows us what God's justice is like. In the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus was raised back to life with this new and immortal body. I mean, still the same, but, but somehow different, perfected. And he, and he offers us a promise of that same kind of resurrection. We're going to get these bodies that last forever. And, and it's, they're just going to be given to us as a gift. You get a body, you get a body, you get a body. Everybody gets a resurrection body when they trust in Jesus. It's going to last forever. It's not something that we earn, right? It's nothing that we do because of our constant work, but we receive that promise of resurrection, that hope of resurrection as a gift. It's something we receive freely. And again, look, I I would never advocate that, that like, this is not about being lazy, okay? It's not that God doesn't have work for us to do. Of course he does. And we say that at the end of the liturgy all the time, right? Lord, send us out to do the work you've given us to do, right? So God gives us work, but it's the kind of work that flows from who we are in him. So it's not the kind of work that feels like this is this oppressive dread kind of thing. But it's the kind of work that, that we were always meant to do. It's the kind of work that makes you feel free to do it because you're no longer afraid of death. And we do that work. And as we do that work, the, the gifts and the grace just keep coming in Jesus, which is why he's the fulfillment of Sabbath, which is itself a grace. Um, we are freely incorporated into a household of faith, into a church. And in that, we express imperfectly now. I mean, it's imperfect. I get that. But we, we express this rest, this household. We express that, that in, the, in the people of God, every need is met. That is part of what justice means in the Bible, is that every need of the people of God is met. So I want to be clear that Jesus fulfills, exemplifies, reveals the spiritual and eternal meaning of the Sabbath contained in the Old Testament. So there's an expansion there. There's a a revelation there. It's beautiful. But he's not negating the physical and present implications of that Sabbath either. So at the start of his earthly ministry, of his earthly ministry, Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He goes on the Sabbath. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, we were just reading from that ourselves, is given to him. So he unrolls the scroll and, and he turns to where it's written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. See, when we are faithful to the Lord of the Sabbath, every 
year is a year of jubilee in his house. Or at least has the potential to be. Again, part of that, part of how much we see that in the present before Jesus comes back has to do with how much we're going to trust him, how much we're going to give him. So, no, the, the, the people of God are no longer under the specifics of Old Testament law. But we're still ca- called to trust God in the here and now. And we can't do that if we're always working and never resting. We're never going to be able to live justly until we allow the, the Sabbath to orient our lives towards God's justice. And that justice is a way of being, and I hope you've seen this today, this morning, already from the scriptures, that this justice is a way of being that includes all the people of God from every nation and ethnicity and culture, women and men, young and old, worshiping together as equals in this kind of profound unity and diversity. And that this justice is marked by mercy, Because, I mean, if we don't see mercy in Christ on the cross, I mean, what do we see? You know, it's marked by mercy. It's marked by freedom. Physically and spiritually. And above all, above all, it's grounded in the provision and hope of love of God, of the love of God in Christ. So, I'll conclude with this. As the author of Hebrews wrote, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. See, I'm not just making it up. It still has to do with us. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Let us therefore, brothers and sisters, strive to enter that rest. Amen.